four o'clock by my clock, which means it's probably 3 p.m. for most of you all. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, I have shared my slides. Um, let me know if you all cannot see those. I'm, it's a little bit difficult for me to see the chat with, um, with the screen sharing going on. So I think, okay, excellent, thank you. Um, okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for um, coming to this talk today. I'm really excited to be talking with you all. Um, my name is Megan Hodge and I am currently the head of teaching and learning at VCU Libraries in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I'm also currently a counselor at large for the American Library Association, and I am the editor of the Future Academic Librarians Toolkit, um, a book that came out um, with ACRL last year. Um, all of these things are relevant to what I'll be talking about today. Um, so hopefully, as you um, can see from the title, and as you saw from the um, the session description. Um, what I'll be doing today is talking about getting published in books, whether that is as a chapter author um, or as a book editor, um, and also talking a bit about getting involved in ALA and library associations in general. Um, before we get started, though, um, since I've told you all a little bit about me, um, it's helpful for me to know who you all are and kind of what your interests are. Um, so I've built a couple polls into our session for today. Um, so Mike, if you can go ahead and pull up our first poll, it's the, our first question is just a kind of like a real simple one. I'm just curious to know kind of where you are in your careers. So I'll give you all a little bit of time to answer this. I'm just checking to see um, how many folks are still in library school, how many folks are um, looking for jobs currently, how many folks are already working. Give it another couple seconds. Looks like we've got most folks in at this point. Okay, looks like most of the votes are in. I see, looks like um, a majority of folks are in their second or later library job. And then um, a second most popular category of folks who are still in library school and then evenly split between um, our other two categories. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Um, so I'm sharing my contact information here um, in case anyone has follow up questions that I'm not able to get to today. I've, I'm um, hopefully some time at the end in case you all have questions. Um, but if you um, aren't able to get your question answered or if you think of something later, I've got my contact information listed here. Um, and I will also list it again at the, the next um, or at the end of my session. So um, first up, I'm going to talk about um, getting started with publishing in book chapters. And this is because book chapters are a really great way to get started in publishing um, if you are new to that and don't have too much experience with that. Um, and as you can see here, it says publishing book chapters rather than publishing books. Um, so if you're wondering what I mean by publishing a single book chapter, it's very common in some fields, including libraries, um, to have books on a particular topic that consist of collections of essays that are all written by different people. Um, these books have one to three editors um, who are responsible for the direction of the book. The book that I published um, is an example of this, where I um, edited the book rather than serving as the sole author. Um, I'll talk more about editing um, a little bit later on. That's um, kind of part two of our talk today. Um, so for now, we're going to focus on the author side with book chapter writing. So if you are still in library school or new to the field, um, you might think that you don't have much to write about because you haven't done the kind of empirical research necessary for publishing in most uh, peer reviewed journals. Um, this is something that I often hear from folks who are uh, trying to get published. They just aren't really sure what to write about. Um, and this is the really beautiful thing about book chapters. Um, chapters are rarely going to require you to have done the sort of empirical research generally required by peer reviewed articles. Um, 
and they're fantastic for folks who are new to the field because um, the editors of the book will tell you what they are looking for so you aren't necessarily having to kind of brainstorm ideas on your own. So um, the way this process generally works is the editor will post a call for chapter proposals out on um, relevant email library lists, um, ALA Connect, places like that. Um, so this is one of multiple reasons that it's great to be subscribed to relevant library lists if you aren't already. Um, and um, if, you're, if you have questions about particular library lists to join, your professors, I'm sure, will um, have recommendations for you. Um, there's a couple blogs that collate calls for proposals or CFPs. It's a very common acronym you'll see, um, call for proposal, um, that I like to recommend too, that just kind of collate calls for proposals in one place. Um, the main kind of generalist one um, in the profession is a library writer's blog, and that's librarywriting.blogspot.com. Um, they also have a Twitter, um, library CFP, very uh, straightforward, um, and different types of libraries, like academic libraries, for example, will often have kind of like their own collators. Um, so like that, there's a website, for example, called um, Academic Writing Librarians that does this for academic calls for proposals. Um, which brings me to my next poll question, um, which is just to kind of um, find out from you all um, how many um, of you have already submitted proposals to things before, whether that's for a conference, um, for a book chapter, for, um, for anything else. Um, if you can bring that poll up, Mike. Give you all a little bit of time to answer. Okay. Uh, most folks have answered. This is very quick. Only two options to choose from and we're half and half with half of folks having um, already submitted a proposal of some sort um, and the other half not yet. Excellent. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a very, very recent um, call for proposals for a book that went out. Um, you can see the date here, November 11th of this year. Um, so this is an example of something that you might see where a CFP, a call for proposals, is um, just very general. Um, you can see here um, that it's just just a very, very broad, um, they're just looking for folks to write about their experiences um, with undergraduate research, for example. Um, so this is an example where editors will often look for folks who are doing a certain kind of work. Um, so with this, if you are in a position having worked with um, an undergraduate research program, this is basically an opportunity to tell your story. Um, chapters in these sorts of books are meant to be very practical. Um, so what have you done that worked well that other libraries could learn from? Um, have you tried something that maybe didn't work as planned and you have some takeaways that would be useful to other libraries? Um, so this is a, a really good example of just kind of like a general um, call for proposals on something where just your the nature of your work might qualify you to um, write a chapter for this. Um, this is a snippet from another very recent call for proposals. I've, um, for space reasons, I've cut off the title, um, but this is for a book called Land in Libraries. Um, and this is an example of um, editors giving you some additional information. You can see here we have a list of suggested topics that they're hoping for from. Um, so um, you'll often kind of see both of these in, in calls for proposals where, you know, there's kind of like a general idea of, of what the editors are looking for, or they might have more specific suggestions. Um, but usually, even in this case, like we have a list here, this is a non-exclusive list. So if you have something else um, that might be relevant, um, but isn't listed here, you're always welcome to propose that. Um, this is an example of the other um, kind of type of book chapter um, proposal that you see um, come out in that this is this is not practical um, in the way that the undergraduate research um, book is. This is more of a philosophical book. You can just kind of tell from this little snippet that I've grabbed here. Um, 
So these, both of these types of chapters are really great for folks who are new to the profession, um, either because um, you can just write about something that you're doing in your job. It doesn't even necessarily have to be something super innovative. It could just be you talking about your work. Um, or in this case, um, with a, kind of like a more philosophical or um, conceptual chapter, um, this could just be something that if you're, you know, if you've been thinking about any of these issues, you could potentially write um, a chapter kind of off the top of your head. Um, or if it's an area of interest, um, you could do some, you know, research into databases and, you know, write a paper, maybe not dissimilar to the kinds of papers that you've written in graduate school. Um, so let's say you have found a call for proposals that is interesting to you and you're interested in submitting a proposal. What does that actually involve? Um, generally, you aren't going to be required to submit a whole lot of information, um, you know, because they it goes through a review process, so they don't want you to put too much work in up front. Um, generally, editors are going to ask you to provide a tentative title, um, a really brief summary of what you intend to talk about, maybe three to 500 words, um, and, you know, like a, a list of co-authors if you plan to um, write um, with additional folks. Sometimes you'll also be asked to provide a writing sample or a resume or CV um, just to help the editors get an idea of what your writing uh, prowess um, and style is to see that it would be a good fit for their book. Um, but that's it. Um, and three to 500 words is really not a lot of, in, um, of length, really. Um, so you don't really have to have your chapter fully thought through by the time you submit your proposal. However, one very important word of advice um, here, you don't have to have like drafted your entire chapter when submitting a proposal, but it is very important to take a look at what the expected word count is um, in that call for proposals in that CFP. Um, generally, editors are going to share that in the CFP. If they don't, you can always email them and ask. This is important because you want to make sure you have enough content um, to actually get you through that word count. Um, a lot of book chapters are only three to 5,000 words, and that's pretty easy to, to reach. But um, sometimes you'll have editors asking for seven to 10,000 words. Um, and depending on the topic, you just might not have enough content for that. So um, you can save yourself a little um, stress um, if you kind of think through how much content um, you have kind of in relation to that expected word count. All right. So let's say you've submitted a proposal. Um, it has been accepted. Um, well, actually, let me pause and talk a little bit about the timeline um, for acceptance. So generally, calls for proposals are open um, for a few weeks. It often takes editors a few weeks to review proposals um, because most folks tend to submit right at the deadline. Um, so between you submitting your proposal and hearing back from the editors, it might be a couple months. Um, I recommend that you save all proposals that you write, um, even if you don't get accepted this time. Um, there's always going to be another CFP that comes out probably um, on the same or similar topic some point in the future, um, and you might be able to dust off that proposal and reuse it um, in the future, even if it isn't accepted this go around. However, if you are accepted, um, obviously that's great. Um, the timeline here will kind of will vary depending on who your editors are. Um, I have written eight book chapters for eight different um, editors, um, probably four or so different publishers, and the timeline has always varied a bit, but um, three months seems to be a really common um, kind of timeline for a first draft being due. Um, after this first draft is submitted, you will go through probably multiple rounds of um, revisions and edits with your editor. Um, and these edits will include some of the sorts of things that you would expect in any form of writing, uh, where they might ask you to kind of expand upon or clarify some things. Um, but you will also in book chapters have kind of additional edits requested in my experience. Um, you will see, you know, authors who after having read everyone's chapters will really like something that one particular author did and then they want all the authors to do that. Um, or after they see kind of the whole 
book come together, they're like, oh, there's there's this gap that still needs to be filled and they'll kind of touch base with authors about filling those. Um, this whole process, writing and revising can take upwards of a year depending on um, who your editors are. So, um, you know, this is, this is not a short term process. Um, and it gets even longer because once you have um, kind of finalized your chapter, your editor is happy with it, it goes off to the publisher. Um, and then there's more rounds. Um, so the first thing that the publisher will do um, is they will have their copy editors go over all of the um, all of the chapters. Um, they've got professional copy editors on staff. So your, your editor probably won't be doing too much of that. Um, and once those copy editors have finished their work, you will get a copy of your chapter back um, with those edits, those copy edits called out. Um, and you will have the opportunity to review and either accept or reject those edits that they've made. Um, most of the time, it's pretty straightforward. You're going to want to accept those, but sometimes there's like little things, like maybe they turn something into a proper noun that shouldn't have been um, that you will want to reject. Then it goes back to the publisher and you as the chapter author will not see anything happen for a while. Um, the book will need to get typeset, um, which is you know turning it from like a Word doc basically into whatever format it will look like for, um, you know, in the actual published book. Um, and it needs to be sent off to the printers and get printed. And so this whole process um, once your what you consider kind of like your finalized draft um, pre copy edit to publication date can also take upwards of a year. So again, this is a long, a long process that we're talking about here. Um, so kind of from the whole process. Um, you know, call for proposals to publication date. Sometimes it can take two to three years and that's very normal. Um, so this is not immediate gratification, um, but um, yeah, but you get a line on your CV, your resume, which is obviously great. Um, I will say as chapter author, um, you generally are not going to get paid for your efforts, but again, you get a line on your CV. Um, you will generally get a kind of finished typeset copy of your chapter for your own records or uh, for posting in your institutional repository. Um, and often publishers will give you a free copy of the whole book as well. Um, it might be a print copy, it might be an electronic copy. Um, so that's really nice. So you can kind of see what the finished product looks like. Okay, um, that's um, Publishing in the form of book chapters. Um, part two um, is editing books. And this is um, granted uh, sample size of one here. This is just my experience, um, but hopefully there's some kind of helpful tidbits here for folks who are interested in potentially publishing a book at some point. So um, after you've worked in the field a while, or maybe not even a while, um, I submitted a proposal for my book um, six years after graduating library school. Um, you might see a gap in the literature um, in terms of how a particular topic has been covered um, or the approach to a particular topic. Um, so with my book, for example, Future Academic Librarians Toolkit, um, there's all sorts of books out there on finding a job, um, on writing for publication, um, you know, specific job duties of different kinds of librarians, but there wasn't any book out there that really explained to perspective or new librarians, all these other elements that you're just expected to kind of pick up by osmosis on the job. Um, things like how do you afford attending conferences? How do you network if you're an introvert? Um, how do you develop your professional brand to help you get jobs and publication opportunities? All of these things. Um, so editing a book is a really great way of addressing a gap like this without having to write the whole thing yourself. Um, don't get me wrong, um, editing a book is still a ton of work. Um, but if you don't have the, the time or the expertise to kind of address the, this gap in the way that you would like, editing a book is a really great way of um, kind of filling that gap without having to have all of that expertise yourself. So um, once you have a topic in mind for a book, you need to find a publisher for it. 
Um, I'm gonna drop in the chat after um, I'm done talking. Uh, uh, there's a really nice list that um, San Jose State, um, their library school has come up with kind of listing all of the um, main library publishers and it provides a profile for each of those with the type of books they publish. Um, the typical topics they tend to publish authors on um, and links to submission guidelines. So I'll drop that in the chat um, after I'm done chatting. Um, and just like with book chapters, as you might expect, you need to submit a proposal um, in order to kind of get the, the ball rolling in terms of potentially having a book published. So unlike the book chapter proposal process, this is a, a whole lot more involved. Um, so this is a screenshot. This is just a snippet of my book proposal. Um, so there's a lot more pieces um, to this. Um, so in addition to providing a tentative title, um, a couple paragraphs describing kind of like what the book is going to be about, um, they'll often also ask you for a suggested um, table of contents. Um, and for the record, these are all things that um, are just tentative. The publisher recognizes that they might change, especially if you're doing an edited book rather than an, an authored book. Um, they also want to see an expected timeline. So you can see here, that's what this, this main screenshot is of. I made a little Gantt chart. Um, and this is just, I think, and I'm just sort of hypothesizing here. I haven't actually talked to anyone about this to see if it's true, um, but I, I suspect that part of this is sort of a thought exercise for um, authors and editors um, to just kind of think through all the necessary logistical steps in terms of how much time each step might take um, and kind of mapping that out against all the other things that you might have going on to make sure it's gonna fit into your schedule. Um, this is all subject to change. Um, you know, my timeline did not end up, you know, looking quite like this, um, but they do want you to put some thought into um, how long each stage might take right up at the beginning. Um, the publisher is also going to want to know um, who your target audience is. Um, you know, publishers are businesses and they want to make sure that there's going to be a readership out there for your book. So if it's a super arcane topic that might not sell a lot, um, you might have a tough case um, for, for getting your book published. So thinking about who your target audience is, is important. Um, you're also going to need to provide information about you and what qualifies you to write or edit this book. Um, so this is super similar to writing a cover letter for a job application. Um, you really want to tailor your experience and your credentials to um, kind of the, the topic of the book that you're proposing, like what qualifies you to write this. Um, so for me, with my book, um, Future Academic Librarians Toolkit, geared towards uh, new and prospective academic librarians, um, I spent a lot of time um, in this section of my proposal talking about how most of my scholarship and service um, had been dedicated to supporting new librarians. Uh, and so that made a really solid case for me being qualified to um, put together a book that would address the needs of new academic librarians. Finally, the publisher is going to want you to spend some time thinking through and identifying um, some competitive titles. So what are some other books that are already out there on your topic? Um, summarize those and identify how is your book going to be different? Like if, if this topic is one that's already out there um, kind of in, in um, you know, library land, how is your book going to be a new and necessary contribution? Um, so you're, you're going to want to make a case for yourself here. And um, this is, you know, so many pieces of the, the book process, whether you're an author or an editor, involves waiting. Um, so after you submit your proposal, it will be reviewed um, by some folks. Um, and most publishers have content strategists whose job it is to um, kind of read these proposals, work with authors, you know, through kind of the drafting process. Um, some publishers also have committees that review proposals. ACRL is an example of this. 
Um, and if your proposal is accepted, it's likely that um, either the content strategist or the committee is going to request some changes for you um, kind of moving forward. Um, I encourage you to accept those with a, an open mind. Um, the, again, the publisher is in the business of selling books. They know um, what will sell and, you know, um, they have experience um, with identifying what might make your book um, better and more useful. Um, with my book, for example, I had originally proposed a couple chapters talking about um, work like instruction um, and being a liaison. Um, and I got some really excellent feedback from the committee um, suggesting that I also include um, some profiles of some non-public services positions in academic libraries. Um, so again, just be open to feedback. Um, at this point, you'll be asked to sign a contract, which is super exciting, signing your, your um, first book contract, at least it was for me. Um, and this contract, among other things, outlines the royalties that the publisher will pay you for each copy of your book that is sold. Um, something I encourage you to consider um, is joining the Authors Guild um, once you have been offered a contract. Um, a service that the Authors Guild offers to all members um, is they will review um, and offer feedback on book contracts for free to members. Um, so I made a number of revisions to my contract that I got from ACRL as a result of the feedback that I got um, and actually substantially increased the royalties that I was gonna be paid for ebook copies of my book. Um, so you, you might actually end up recouping the membership um, fee for um, the Authors Guild um, in this way, for example. Okay, so your proposal has been accepted, you sign your contract, um, what comes next? Um, at this point, you're sending out your call for chapter proposals, which we've already talked about from the author side of things. So at this point, your job is really to answer questions that you're getting from authors and keeping your contact at the publisher informed as to your progress and if you're going to be late meeting any of your deadlines. Um, speaking of being late, um, life happens. There's a lot of life happening right now. Um, and your authors are going to miss deadlines. You're going to have authors who need more handholding than others, which takes more time. Um, I, for example, had one author who nine months in decided that they, you know, they just weren't going to be able to write the chapter. So I had to scramble for a replacement. Um, your publisher has been through this many, many times. Um, they will expect that there will be delays, that the timeline you originally gave them is not going to be um, the one that ends up being used in practice. Um, what's really important is just kind of keeping them in the loop um, so you don't just kind of um, drop off the radar. Um, Having already described the drafting and revision process from the author side, I will just say as an editor um, that authors tend to kind of run the full spectrum. Um, you'll probably have some who submit just about perfect work, need hardly any revisions. Um, you might also have some folks who just require substantive revisions if we're multiple drafts. Um, but most folks, I suspect this was the case for me anyway, are going to kind of fall in the middle um, and not be kind of on the far ends of those spectrums. Um, so it's, it's, a, um, it's a real skill providing feedback to authors um, because you want to make sure that you are providing feedback in a way that is constructive and positive um, and is going to get you the content in your chapters that you're looking for. Okay. Road to publication. So um, you've worked with your authors. Um, you've gotten their chapters looking the way that you would like them to. Um, you submit the manuscript to the publisher. Um, and we've already talked about the copy editing and the typesetting um, process. Um, so, and again, that whole process takes about a year generally. Um, after the book has actually been published, um, the publisher, not surprisingly, uh, will uh, want help selling copies of the book. So they will often want your assistance in promoting it. Um, so this might take the form of book signings at a library conference. Um, so exhibitors, you know, publishers are often exhibitors and have booths in the exhibit hall. 
um, at large conferences like ALA. Um, and they very frequently have book signings or kind of like little mini presentations on recently published books. Um, the publisher might also um, have you develop webinars um, on the book content. So th these are all um, things that you can expect to be called upon to do as a book editor. Um, and then you can see my last little graphic here is dollar signs. Um, so very exciting when you get your first royalty check. Um, these can be sent semi-annually, annually, it depends on the publisher. Um, super exciting and welcome, um, but I will just say that no one will be quitting their, their day job um, as a result of their, their book royalties. Um, it's always a pleasure to get that check in the mail, but um, you, know, you don't go into the library book publishing business as like an individual editor um, expecting to uh, be able to quit your day job. Alrighty. Okay. Part three. Um, last part here. And this is getting involved in um, ALA. Um, but this, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be true for other library associations as well. Um, so now it's time for our last poll. Um, and this is just asking folks um, how involved um, you've been in ALA so far. Again, just to kind of give me an idea where you're at. Thanks, Mike. So we've got a couple different options here. I'll let you take some time to read that. Okay, looks like a plurality of folks have joined some associations, uh, maybe a committee or two as well, but haven't gotten too much more involved um, than that. Um, some folks who've also joined ALA, um, but aren't quite sure what to do beyond that, um, you know, because there's all these subgroups in ALA. Um, and we've got um, one, one person who has um, been in some leadership positions. So that's great. Thank you. Okay. So um, let me start by kind of first saying why getting involved professionally um, is so useful. Um, and this is true for ALA or, you know, kind of any, really any library association. This might be your state association. If you're planning on going into a special kind of library, like a law library or medical library, you might have um, a special association like AALL or MLA um, that is more relevant to you than ALA. And that's, um, that's totally fine. Um, a lot of, um, what I'm going to say here in terms of the benefits is going to be true regardless of the library association. Um, so the first uh, main benefit is just growing your professional network. Um, and this is really helpful in terms of getting you additional um, opportunities to publish and present. Folks will reach out to you knowing your expertise and ask if you want to um, you know, write something or present on something, maybe serve on a, a conference panel. Um, a number of the authors in my book, I re just reached out to personally because I knew them and I knew their work um, and I just invited them to be chapter authors. So that's an example um, of how you can use your professional network. Um, Getting involved in library associations can also make or break your job application. Um, I was actually hired into my very first um, librarian professional position, which is in a public library, um, even though I'm now in an academic library. Um, because of my professional involvement, one of the administrators on the search committee told me um, that um, even though I had no public library experience at the time that I applied, um, that they were really impressed by how involved I was um, at the state and national level. And that was a, one of the deciding factors for um, selecting me to, to be hired. Um, if you're interested in making kind of like a real impact on the profession, um, there's some really, really big things that you can't do unless you are involved in your library association. So if you're interested in being a um, children's librarian, for example, and serving on the Caldecott Committee, which is the committee that decides which book is going to get the Caldecott Award each year, um, you can only do that by being a member of the Caldecott Committee, which is um, part of uh, ALA. Um, if you're an academic librarian, you've probably heard of the Framework for Information Literacy. 
um, that was also developed by um, a task force, which was um, through ALA. So these are the sorts of opportunities that you're just not going to have an opportunity to be participating in um, unless you're a member of the organization. Um, it's also just really fun. Um, there's committees out there for just about everything that you might be interested in. You know, I've mentioned kind of like a couple like big name um, important things, um, but I mean, there's also committees whose entire purpose is organizing the socials um, at conferences and socials are basically just parties and it's literally the committee's entire work is just organizing the conference party that occurs at ALA or ACRL or um, PLA or what have you. Um, it's also just really great for helping keep you grounded. Um, so, you know, if you are just having a day at work where you're just kind of, you know, overwhelmed by, you know, the, the patrons going ballistic over the 10 cent, you know, fine that they were charged um, or, you um, you know, just you're just having a bad week at work in general, it can be really refreshing and rejuvenating to kind of connect with folks um, who are doing the kind of big picture work um, that probably got you interested in going into libraries to begin with. Um, so um, just lots of reasons as far as I'm concerned to, to get involved with your profession. Um, so I've mentioned a few here. Um, if you um, have kind of additional um, things that you're hoping to get out of membership or um, if you're already involved and have additional benefits um, that I haven't mentioned that have been true for you, feel free to put those in the chat um, just so we can kind of learn from each other. Um, all right, so hopefully I've convinced you um, that it's worthwhile to join some library associations. Um, but ALA in particular is really huge. This is going to be um, not as overwhelming if you're like joining your state association, some of the more specialized associations um, probably won't be as overwhelming, but ALA is just huge. Um, and that's not surprising. So I mean, their, their, their goal is to represent all library workers, all library types. Um, so they've got tens of thousands of members. And so you're understandably gonna have lots of groups. However, that can result in just kind of being like a deer in the headlights, you join and then you see this, you know, when you join, it asks you about all these, you know, things called divisions and round tables. Um, and it asks if you want to join any of these things and you're just kind of like overwhelmed by all of these choices. Um, so where do you actually start um, when you have, you know, you've actually joined your association, but you're trying to figure out how do you actually get involved after you've, you know, paid your membership dues? Um, something I recommend is just finding your home, starting really small with um, just one or two groups. Um, so, um, you know, if you were interested in becoming an instruction librarian, an academic librarian, which example I'm using, because that's, that's what I am, um, you might join ACRL, which is the academic librarians group, um, and then the instruction section within ACRL, which is uh, for the folks who teach. Um, and I recommend kind of starting small and just kind of like finding your home um, in the association. And again, whether this is ALA or some other group, um, because however things work there is going to generally be true um, elsewhere in the organization. Um, so like the process for volunteering for committees, the type of work that you do on those committees. Um, these are, you know, the kind of the process for communications, the reporting lines, these are all basically going to be roughly similar across the organization. Um, so kind of starting small and finding your home can be a way of making it more manageable. Um, I'm going to recommend that you do not do what I did um, initially, which was when I first started library school, um, I was just so excited. I joined ALA. Um, and you get that student discount um, when you um, are joining as a student. And I was just so excited by everything and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I just joined everything. Um, I joined every group. Um, and then I proceeded to get just about a million emails in my inbox um, from all these different groups that I had joined um, over like the next couple months. And it was super overwhelming. So don't do that. Um, find your home. And if you're someone who, like me, you aren't sure what type of librarianship is most interesting to you at this point, um, or even if you are sure, um, but you're still new to the association and, and kind of trying to figure out how to navigate, um, I'll put in a plug for the new members roundtable. Um, 
the whole point of the new members roundtable of ALA and a lot of library associations, even not ALA, are going to have a group that's for new members. And the whole goal of these new members groups is basically to help um, new members kind of acclimate to the association. And they generally define their membership by new to the association, not new to the profession. So if you're someone who has been working in libraries for a long time, but you haven't joined the association before, you would count as a new member. Um, and um, they also offer lots of other benefits too. Speaking of which, um, getting involved um, kind of more deeply, what does that involve? Um, generally, that's going to be committee work, um, which doesn't sound super exciting, I will admit. But again, uh, think back to some of those things that I mentioned before, being able to pick out the Caldecott winner, um, you know, developing like a really instrumental document like the Framework for Information Literacy, um, planning conference, socials, that sort of thing. Um, the thing about getting involved, um, aka joining committees, um, and this is often going to be true for library associations outside of ALA too, is they often want you to already have some committee experience um, in order to appoint you to a committee. Um, as someone who's been in multiple leadership positions um, in various organizations, including ALA. Unfortunately, there's always folks who just kind of ghost. Um, and they just kind of disappear. They sign up and then you never hear from them and there's work that needs to be done. Um, so one way of kind of mitigating this is, you know, on the committee volunteer forums, which come out every year, um, you will see this, um, you know, on the email discussion list for uh, whatever group you signed up for every year, a volunteer form will come out. Um, generally, that volunteer form is going to ask for um, your previous committee experience, and this is their way of kind of vetting um, whether you you're actually going to kind of, um, you know, carry your weight basically on the committee. However, if you're in a position of not having been on a committee before, it's sort of a catch-22. How do you get the experience if you don't already have the experience? Um, and this is a really another great benefit of groups like NMRT. Um, again, regardless of whether that's ALA or whether it's a new members group in a state association, a special library association, um, these new member groups generally do not have the same sort of requirements for getting um, committee appointments that other groups do. Um, as you might imagine, getting on a, a committee um, like the Caldecott is super, super competitive. Um, so serving on these sorts of committees um, in groups like New Members Roundtable uh, for ALA can be, you know, the ALA New Members Roundtable guarantees committee appointments to anyone who's a member in good standing. Um, so that's a really great way of starting to get some committee experience. Um, so you can then apply later on for some of those maybe shinier committees that you're more interested in. Um, just a couple last things about serving on committees. Um, most committee work, um, even before the pandemic, of course, everything is virtual now. Um, but even before the pandemic, most committees had transitioned most, if not all of their work to, to being virtual. So if you aren't able to attend conferences, that shouldn't stop you in most cases. Um, it's just a recognition that it's a barrier to um, participation if you um, are only able to be on a committee if you can attend a conference. Um, one final piece of advice I will give you when trying to get onto a committee um, is it generally asks you to, um, it will offer a space for you to write about why you want to join a particular committee. Um, and I encourage you to not leave that blank, but to fill that in and be thoughtful about that. Um, again, it can be very competitive to be on certain committees um, and there might be hundreds of people vying for just a handful of spots. So if you can provide kind of a, an argument and sell yourself about why, um, you know, your experience or why you're interested um, in being on a particular committee, that will make it much more likely that you will get appointed to that committee. Okay, that's just about all the content I had prepared. Um, at this point. So I will, um, again, I've got my contact information here, but I wanted to leave a few minutes for um, questions if you all had um, any. Um, and I see one question already. Um, do you know the percentage of books that are being published in print versus ebook or both? Um, I think 
a lot of this depends on the publisher. Um, with ALA, um, they are, I mean, regardless of whether we're talking ALA or, you know, a subsidiary like ACRL, just about everything is coming out in print and ebook. Um, some other publishers tend to favor um, print more. I haven't seen electronic copies as much. Um, so it's, it's sort of hard to say. Um, but ALA is kind of like a big publisher and they're kind of like a parent publisher for other um, kind of imprints like Neil Schumann and Facet. Um, so they're doing a good amount of the, the library publishing these days. Um, another question, um, have you found success proposing a chapter or a book as a solo author or editor or is it expected to be a joint effort? Um, excellent question. Just about all of my, so I've um, edited one book, published eight chapters. Um, only two of the chapters have been co-written. Um, everything else, I, I edited my book by myself. I wrote the, the majority of my chapters by myself. Um, I will say that in terms of editing, um, it's a ton of work to edit. So I do frequently see um, multiple editors um, for, for the book editing side of things, but for chapters, um, it's totally fine for it to be, in most cases, you know, one or multiple people. Yeah, so um, if you've got a great idea, um, but, you know, maybe you have a, like a, a friend or a colleague who um, has something that they would be able to contribute, it's generally going to be okay to kind of co-author um, a, a chapter together. Um, any other questions? All righty. Well, it was really lovely talking with you all. Um, oh, and I promised, I did promise that I was going to share a bunch of links in the chat. So let me go ahead and do that while you all are potentially still pondering questions. Um, and I did see a question come in. Um, is the process similar for periodicals? Um, the publishing process for periodicals, so like peer review journals, is going to look a lot different in a lot of ways. Um, and that's because you're often expected to have done empirical research um, in order to get that published. And so it goes through a peer review process, which most books and book chapters do not um, go through a peer review process. It goes through editorial review, but no, no blind peer review. Um, and yeah, that, that's, a, that's a topic for a whole separate um, webinar. So the, the process is, is very different. Um, I'd be happy to chat about that too if, um, with folks who've got questions. Um, another question, um, is there other ways to get involved with associations beyond committees? Yeah, so this is going to depend a lot on kind of the nature of, I mean, by, by the association, really. Um, so um, committees are kind of like defined as being kind of like standing, like they, they tend to exist year over year. Um, there might also be more emergent needs where like you'll have like a task force, which is kind of like addressing more ad hoc issues um, put together. Um, so like right now, the big thing in ALA is like restructuring a ALA. So you might've heard about forward together. Uh, and that's the task force that's kind of undergoing this massive, massive um, process of kind of like trying to shepherd ALA through kind of like this restructuring. Um, so those task forces tend to, um, you know, be a little bit more flexible in terms of how folks are appointed. Um, but I would encourage, especially folks um, who are just kind of like interested in getting involved and aren't really sure where to start, um, you're always always, always very welcome to reach out to the leadership of a particular um, group. Um, you know, so this might be like the chair of a section um, in ALA, it might be like the, the chair of like a forum for your state association and just let them know that you're new um, and interested in getting involved. Um, and, and, you know, there's lots of stuff that happens behind the scenes that doesn't really get posted um, kind of publicly for folks to apply to. Uh, but just 
kind of putting a bug in leadership's ear that you're there and available and have interest in something can be a really great way of just getting kind of appointed to something um, that might be just a really exciting short-term project. Um, so that's another thing that I would recommend. Um, another question about um, book chapters and how comprehensive the lit review portion has been. Um, this, it really depends on the nature of the, um, of the chapter, if it's more practice oriented um, or if it's more philosophical. Um, the philosophical chapters tend to kind of have um, literature references kind of sprinkled throughout because you're kind of making an argument. Uh, if it's more practice oriented, um, I mean, especially since so many chapters are relatively short, only about 3000 words, you might just have like a paragraph devoted to the lit review. Um, so not too much, in other words. All right, well, we are right at um, 10 minutes to the hour. Um, so I am going to wrap up for now. Um, I will drop my um, contact information into the chat. Um, and I believe the slides and the recording are going to be um, shared out. Um, so you'll, you will be able to reference those um, going forward in the future. Um, but I encourage you to, yeah, if you've got kind of an individual question that I wasn't able to um, address here, or if you think of something later, I'm very, very happy to um, help folks. As I mentioned earlier, um, working with folks who are new to the profession has just always been a passion of mine. So I'm very happy to assist in any way that I can. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming in and listening to my chat today. And um, I hope you're all staying safe and well um, during these times. Thank you.